gospel, the early chapters, actually the first chapter still of the gospel, according to St. Mark, uh, Jesus is breaking into new territory, uh, not only in terms of his mission, uh, but in terms of breaking out the good news, uh, the good news of God's promise of new life. And he is not speaking directly about resurrection. He hasn't got that far uh, along the line, but he is starting to show signs that there is new life. And it's the story of uh, his first exorcism or healing uh, in the gospel according to St. Mark. So just remember that this is a story that is being retold uh, about 50 years after the birth of Jesus. So it's still very fresh uh, in the lives of those who actually knew Jesus. Um, and it's a story that has uh, two prongs. One is a story about a healing, and one is about uh, a corrective action within a system. And we'll talk more about that. But this morning, we come to celebrate resurrection. We come to remember these beautiful lives that uh, shared time with us in community and family. Uh, Mary Ann was here for a number of years. And of course, Judy was here for a number of decades. So uh, as we worship in this space that they also occupy, uh, let us give thanks to God uh, for their lives as well. Welcome to worship. morning. Could you uh, rise in body or spirit to join me in the call to worship? Our Sabbath day has arrived. Holy is the time and sacred is the hour. Let us offer God our praise. Great works of God, renowned for peace. Blessed are we, God's people. Open your heart to God's word. Find delight in the Lord's message God is gracious and merciful. God is mindful of our needs. The Lord's covenant endures forever. Faith full of honor. Redemption is the way of the Lord. Salvation is God's promise. Awesome is our Creator's plan. Welcome to worship. Our first hymn is number 173, Christ Whose Glory Fills the Skies.
Let's join together in the opening prayer. Come, O loving one, make known your wonderful presence to your people. Open our minds to the power of your word. Raise us up as your prophetic people. Prepare us for the task of speaking truth to power and mercy to the wounded. Take authority over our hearts and mold them according to your will. Embolden us to silence the voices that seek to separate us from your love and one another. Bless us, O Lord, with a new teaching for your purposes and our healing. Amen. Kids and teens that are here this morning that would like to come up, I welcome you to come to the altar space, to sit on the steps with me. Welcome, welcome. Simindi, Banya, Melanie. Hey, how you doing? Good to see everybody. Welcome, welcome. I have um, something I just wanted to share with you. I have this bookmark from the Everett C. Benton Library. Anybody ever hear of it? No. Yes, Hannah has. It, down the road on the corner. I think you used to live in that neighborhood, right? Did you visit the library when you were younger? Some of your first books, maybe. Have you been there? You love it. Yeah, yeah. Well, this part of the story of this uh, Everett C. Benton Library is that when the Methodists were in Belmont looking, the Methodists being the church that became this church, were looking, the people were looking for a place to worship. They worshiped in the Benton C. Library. The oh, Everett C. Benton Library. Did you know that? That our church, before this building, when people were getting together and they were calling themselves Methodist, they used that little tiny chapel, which is now a library. If you look up on the roof of the, of the Benton Library, you'll see a little cross in a circle. I think it's still there. That's where the story began. That's where the story of this church began, I've been told. It's a wonderful little piece of history to think that that little building with a few people became a wonderful, wonderful church and still is. And you're part of the story. You're part of that story. You're part of that story that started way back at the library. Oh, I don't know. I think there was dinosaurs roaming through Belmont about that time. I don't know how long ago. It was probably close, so well over 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. What did you say, Christopher? Yeah, it could be 1859. Yeah, it could be somewhere around there. A long time ago. So I want you, when you go by the library, you think about it, uh, think about how that library started the story of this church. Now, I heard that you're going to do a story telling on stage this morning. You're going to use the story from the Gospel of Mark that we're going to use here. And you get to tell the story in your own way. That's real important. We all take the story, we take God's word, and we tell it in our own way. Sometimes we use words, sometimes we use our hands and our, our feet, sometimes we just use our hearts. But just as you're part of the story of this church, you're also part of Jesus' story, telling his story with your lives. The last little story that I want to just talk about is this story. We're coming up on February, right? What happens in February? Birthdays? Christopher's birthday, of course. That's the first. And mom's birthday. And birthdays, birthdays. Yes, yes. We must celebrate all the birthdays in February. Valentine's Day. Yes. What else happens in February? February break, of course. Yeah, we're getting closer. What else happens? Communion, yep, yep, in the beginning of, not next Sunday, because I'll be away, but the following Sunday, you're right. What else happens during the month of February? 
What's that? You know, events going to start? Yep, yep. These are all. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Anything else? Anything else happen in February? What's that? Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's Black History Month, right? We celebrate, uh, we should be celebrating every month, but February gets labeled or called Black History Month. So I'm going to share a story with you, bits and pieces of, from a book, and maybe I'll get some help from other readers. If you traveled the Underground Railroad, it's a fun little book that teaches us about the Underground Railroad, and it's a way for us to be part of the story, right? So we're all part of the story of this church, of the gospel. You're going to do that on the stage with Mark. And we're part of this story here as well as we read it. So thank you for being part of my story here at the church because you're all characters. You know that. And I love you dearly. And I'm glad you're here to share the message with me. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your word and the way these children make it visible how they do the good work that they do, that they put smiles on our face and they give us the joy of knowing that your word is going to continue in new ways. Bless them as they play, as they learn, as they share the story in their way. And hear us, O oh God, as we join our voices together with these children, with these teenagers, as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray as a way of telling God's story. Hear us, O oh Lord, as we pray. Loving God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Have a good morning. I'll see you a little bit later. Our scripture today is from Mark 1, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. God is still speaking. I invite you to stand with me if you're comfortable doing so as we sing our next hymn, which is Heal Me, Hands of Jesus.
let us pray. Loving and healing God, we take this moment to place ourselves before your altar, to open our hearts wide, and to offer our minds to you. And Lord, if you see a place within us where there is a need for healing, we humbly pray that your life-giving spirit will occupy that space or fall upon us. Help us, O oh God, to hear your word as it has been shared with us through the story of Mark and the voice of Nan. May the word that we have heard also be a source of healing, of hope, and promise. Be with us, O oh God, in the meditations and wanderings of our mind as we place ourselves within this story. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, we pick up this morning, uh, it's one of these times of the year where there is an opportunity to move from one gospel lesson to the next without skipping any verses. And so this particular lection is right on the, on the heels of uh, last Sunday. And you remember last Sunday where Jesus was uh, walking the shoreline of the Galilean Sea and having conversation and building relationships with uh, fishermen and their families. And it was there that he called his first four disciples and he was preaching the good news of God, teaching the good news of God, making the good news of God visible. And as well, he was inviting others to join him to become fishers of men. Those who decided to change their lives were Simon, Andrew, James, and John. They left the shores of the Sea of Galilee and they moved on quickly to Capernaum, not too far away, still in Galilee. And they arrived at the synagogue. It was perfect timing. It was just before the Sabbath. So they were able to prepare and get themselves ready for a time of worship. However, probably to the surprise of those new disciples and some of those that did not know who Jesus was, Jesus assumed a rabbinical posture in the synagogue, which means he sat down and people gathered around him. They knew that he was sitting down to teach, and he did so. And he, begun, he begins, we can only imagine, picking up from where we left off, that he's teaching about the good news of God, because that's what he came to do. That's why he was walking the shoreline. He had a message, he had a story to tell about the good news of God. Whether it included repentance or the fulfillment of God's time on earth or the nearing of the reign of God, we don't know, but we can only imagine that because he disclosed that as his message, from the earlier text, that he would probably be touching on those points. And as people listened to him, they were astounded, according to Mark, that the message that they were hearing, the words that were coming out of Jesus's mouth, were words that they did not expect to hear. They didn't expect to hear, but they were also surprised that Jesus spoke with such authority. Now, mind you, in a synagogue, there were all kinds of rabbinical teachers that would come through. Some were maybe there, living there in Capernaum, and had staked out their parish, if you will, if I can even use that word, 
as that place, that synagogue. So Jesus was more or less a guest preacher at the time. And they were astounded. They really wondered what they were listening to and how this peasant from Nazareth would show up with such authority. Now, they had something to compare Jesus' message to. They had heard, again, lots of rabbinical figures, including scribes who are not rabbinical figures, but they are experts. They're religious experts. And they knew what they were hearing from Jesus was something new. It wasn't like what they had heard before. And of course, again, they were surprised. And in the midst of all this new teaching and this wonderment over Jesus' authority, in walks a man with unclean spirits. Now, typically, such a person would not be welcome in the synagogue because, as you know, anything that's unclean is not welcomed in the holy sacred space of worship. Not only in the space, but no one would want to be near such a person. Nobody would want to touch such a person. But there's no restrictions on this man. He walks in and he starts engaging Jesus. He interrupts Jesus. He had been listening to what Jesus was saying and teaching. He was wanting to know what was the purpose of his teaching. Why was he there? And more specifically, this man possessed by unclean spirits wanted to know what have you to do with us? Now, obviously, he's speaking about the multiple spirits that are within him. But also, I believe he's talking about us, those that are gathered in the synagogue, including the scribes, including all the religious leaders, including that, that system that was built around the synagogue and extends, obviously, to connect with the temple in Jerusalem a huge religious enterprise. What have you to do with this? And then the man with the unclean spirits wants to know, have you come to destroy us? There was great fear. Have you come to destroy us? Well, we know. And Jesus, of course, did not define destruction as part of his mission. He did later on talk about how there would be alienation among family members and brothers and sisters and so on and forth, because for those who would choose to take the story to heart and follow him would cause disruption. But this particular man wanted to know about destruction of that community, of the people there. And then he goes on to say and proclaim and name an identity so early in the story for Jesus. You, Jesus, are the Holy One of God. Well, no one was ready to hear that. Jesus didn't want that to be on the streets. No one was prepared to think about Jesus as being the Holy One of God. And Jesus silences the spirits. Be quiet and come out of him. Again, separating the spirits from the man, the human. The synagogue worshipers, those that were gathered at the feet of Jesus and standing against the walls, witnessed Jesus' authority immediately. There was no waste of time. Just like immediately the Disciples to be got up, left their nets, the boat, their parents to wall on, and follow Jesus immediately. They saw Jesus' authority and witnessed his power. The unclean spirits obeyed him. Jesus' good news of God campaign is now in full swing. He recruited his disciples, not all of them, but four of them, key disciples that would have an incredible 
role throughout the story. Principal roles, especially Simon becomes Peter. And now people, the fisher, men, those that encounter Jesus along the way are getting an opportunity to witness his authority and his power and what God has sent him to do. The campaign of the reign of God is in full swing and it doesn't look like a campaign that anyone ever expected. It doesn't look like the campaigns, the military campaigns of the, the Romans when they would march through with their beautiful large stallions and full armor. It didn't look like any campaign they had ever heard of or seen. For God is at work in the life of Jesus, and this campaign has never been witnessed before. But they knew, the people that witnessed it, knew that there was a new power, a new authority for a new time. They couldn't wrap their minds completely around it or their hearts, but they just knew that something big was happening in their midst. And it centered on this one man, Jesus. Now, some biblical scholars would suggest that the man with the unclean spirits is a symbol. It's a symbol of a system, the scribal system, that has gone bad. That it has become negligent. That it has not maintained its loyalty and its faith to God's word. That it became more of a, of a, a group of religious scholars, if you will, that were more interested in themselves in authority that they could create within the synagogue. And of course, their connection to the bigger picture of the temple. Now, not only were there scribes, we remember hearing about Pharisees and Sadducees and other legal experts and religious leaders in Jesus' time. And there was always debates between all these different religious leaders about resurrection and about cleanliness and so on and so forth. And Jesus sticks himself right into this conversation, and he's bringing up new teachings all the time, which sooner or later are going to get him in trouble as we unfold this story. But Jesus is not entering in this story because there's a void of authority. There was plenty of authority going around. What Jesus was bringing to this conversation and to this scribal organization enterprise, if you will, again, is that he was bringing the news that God's kingdom work is underway. This is a messianic message. This is something that they had not heard before. They've been waiting for it and hoping for it. They, they remember the words of the prophets that this would happen in God's time. And now they get to see it. They get a glimpse. It's something that we always hope for ourselves, to get a glimpse of the kingdom of God before our eyes. And this is the initiation of the story, the one that others would say to their friends and to the family, come and see, come and see, come and get a glimpse, come and listen to Jesus and imagine what it means to be part of the good news, kingdom of God movement. God at work in a new way. Now, in Jesus's time, unclean spirits were not strange or rare occurrences. In your Bible studies over the years, you may remember that unclean spirits were the cause of physical and mental, emotional illnesses. That people were sick with leprosy or whatever the disease may have been because there were unclean spirits or because of certain sin that was committed either by them or by their parents or ancestors. 
Now, these illnesses we recognize today that are very treatable and curable by medicine and science. But in Jesus' time, it was all about unclean spirits. And people believed that only by certain authority could these spirits be dealt with. The only way that they could be overcome is if someone could perform some kind of magical act that would call out the spirits and send them away or have them occupy, for example, the pigs that go off the cliff in the, another story. And Jesus' authority was not magical. Jesus had this authority that they had never experienced to command obedience of the very powers of undoing. Because that's what these powers did. The unclean spirits, they undid God's will and God's purpose in the human. They caused isolation and alienation, marginalization. These unclean spirits were the, the cause of many that would find themselves so far out on the margins of society that they would be sleeping in cemeteries. That's another story you may remember. The powers of undoing are the powers that seek to undo God's will for God's people. Some may say we still witness these unclean spirits in our own world. The way that we behave as humans in a world that has so much, but still we find ourselves trying to undo God's will and God's way for God's people. Others would say we can discover these powers, these unclean spirits in, in human constructs and systems structures. Let us think about the human constructs that, that reflect hate and alienation and oppression into the world. What are those constructs that really do, in our time, reflect unclean spirits? Jesus entered the synagogue to teach God's message of good news. The unclean spirits entered the synagogue seeking to undo God's new teaching and authority. There was that clash, that conflict. And what Jesus did is he undid those very powers by exposing those powers. He broke open the religious rules of uncleanliness, the ones that the scribes and the Pharisees held so tight so they could protect their own interests that went far, far from the biblical mandates. He broke open the rules that isolated and oppressed the sick and the powerless. And he exposed the systems that denied God's will in favor of human wellness and will. Jesus' authority revealed God's will and the purpose of God's will, the purpose of justice and healing and freedom. It all goes back to the words of the prophets when they were trying to expose these same powers that were bringing down the, the people of Israel and separating them from God's will and way. And here again, we hear a new teaching. Jesus drawing from that well of the prophetic message of Isaiah and Micah and the Amos and Jeremiah. Say, so here is this new message. Here is this new word of God at work. Years and years ago, I worked with Head Start parents in a few communities in Western Massachusetts. I was doing community organizing at the time, and we were working in public housing complexes where Head Start parents were living and key to the, to the community life there. 
And we decided on a project that we would work on together. It was a project that seemed very simple, but was very complex. And the project was this. The Head Start parents with their little children were constantly in need of Pedialyte and Tylenol because the little kids were always getting sick and they always needed to have these important pain relievers and Pedialyte, of course, the electrolytes that little kids need, but they couldn't afford it. Pedialyte is expensive. Tylenol is expensive. And so they would go without. They would go without these simple ingredients, simple medications. And the project was this was a new teaching. Because both the parents and the pharmacies didn't know that parents who received Medicaid benefits and all the Head Start parents did could get these items for free. They could be charged to their Medicaid benefits. When we told the story that this was true, that you could get this, nobody believed it. I can't be, how could that be? And there were other items as well that they could get to save money so they could spend more on food or pay rent or whatever so that they could have a healthier family. And so we studied together the Medicaid regulations. We looked at all this fine print and said, yeah, it's true. It's true. It's right here. And we decided as a community that this new teaching, this good news, needed to be brought out into the community. And so the parents, mainly mothers, decided that they would survey the pharmacies. They would go to the pharmacies and they would ask the pharmacist, do you provide Pedialyte, Tylenol, and they had a list of items to parents free of charge if they're Medicaid recipients? Well, the answers came back. Very, very, very few did, even knew about it. Couldn't believe it. They wanted to know what, what kind of news is this, what kind of teaching is this, where are you getting this information? And the parents put all that information together. They published it for their own use, and they put it out to the media to see if the media would be interested in telling their story. Well, the end result was that because of their research, because of their willingness to provide new information and to offer a new teaching to their neighbors, the pharmacies and their communities started providing Tylenol and Pedialyte free of charge to the Medicaid recipients. And in this event, not only were they able to gain the material benefits of their work, they were able to see the power of what a few words could do to change their lives. It was truly a new teaching that was received and exercised by parents who found a new authority that they could go into the word as written by the federal government and see that th certain things were not being followed or exercised to their benefit and that they could make a difference. Now, of course, it was the small change in a system that is so huge and expansive. But it was a new teaching, a new experience. And it brought health and wellness to a few. Jesus' new teaching authority is ours to claim as well. In those words that Jesus and the gospels speak of, the prophets speak of, the psalmists speak of, those are our words, too. That's our story, too, as I was sharing with the children. It's the task of the children to look through the lens of the gospel, as we say, to uncover the systems and structures that deny or seek God's undoing. 
and to seek to deny God's promise of fullness of life. This new teaching authority Christ has gifted us with is, is Holy Spirit powered. It's part of our baptismal experience. New teaching authority is behind Jesus' call and commission. All of us. We have the authority. The challenge is claiming the authority, claiming the authority that we have the authority as the church to make statements, public statements, and to take public action in the name of the gospel. Whether we use those words or not, we do speak from the church. Being a fisher of people requires a new teaching, and it requires people who are willing to claim a new authority. And that's what we have here in this story. And that's what we'll see unfolding. People who are willing to follow Jesus and to claim that new authority, that new story, that power that comes with baptism, that power that comes with the ability to be an alternative community, a family that stands together for the purpose of expanding the good news in word and in deed. The story of the Benton Library is so powerful. I like to imagine five or six Methodists, they're probably former Congregationalists that got kicked out for singing too loud or moving too much. It's often the story here in New England, the Methodists are told, go off and you know, do your own thing, don't come here. But there they were, five or six, they had this new message. They had encountered maybe a circuit rider or someone who was preaching in Boston or some other town nearby and, and they were challenged. They were challenged to claim the authority in the Wesleyan sense to bring the word of God into the community. And they accepted the challenge. They claimed the authority. And out of that small group of people came this wonderful place. And now it's grown through the years. when it used to be filled, and even the balcony. Two or three services on Easter. Much different today. But where are we? We're back at our roots. We're back at a small group of people that can make a gospel difference as long as we're willing to claim the authority and the power that comes with being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's a new teaching. People will be astounded what a small group of Methodists can do, a small group of Christians can do. And I suggest to you that every great Christian endeavor and movement that brings change starts with just a few people. Are we those people? Yes, we are. I look forward to, to seeing how we move forward in the next few months on how to claim the authority that we have and the possibilities and opportunities that are tied and woven into that authority. May God bless us and empower us in ways that we cannot imagine. May God call us to confront the powers that seek to undo God's will and way so that we can proclaim to the world, this is the good news of God. Amen. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we, we bow our heads, we close our eyes, we fold our hands, we sit quietly, we turn ourselves over to you, we present ourselves before you, we lift up to you the depths of our heart, and we embrace with this heart that we hold within us 
the spirit of your love, those that we have named before you, and the many that are unnamed, and the circumstances and situations of this world where the powers of war and hate continue to seek to undo your love. But we, O oh God, we stand in the midst of your story, of your word, of your promise, and the hope that we, your people, can be part of your great project, your good news work. And so in doing so, we pray. We, we have conversation with you, silent conversation, wordy conversation, loud crying conversation. We call upon you, O Lord, because we know you're listening. So when we name our loved ones and friends who are sick in mind, body, or spirit, we know that you are embracing Liz and Linda and Frank and Bob and all those who we think of day in and day out. And Lord, we know that you are listening and have received into your loving care Mary Ann and Judy. We know that, oh God, because the words, the story, the testimony of your son Jesus has shed light upon the realities of what it means to live in this world as well as what it means to live in faith. Faith that we share, believing that there's nothing, nothing that can separate us from your love. And so it's with this confidence that we pray and we rejoice when we hear things, stories, testimonies, like Nan's telling us that her sister Dodie is back home, back home after seven months. Lord, we know that some may be unwilling to call this a miracle. Uh, surely science and medicine and situations and conditions like Dodi have much to do with healing and renewal. But how can it not be that your hand was upon the hands of those experts? And so, O oh God, we pray and give thanks for this community. This small gathering of people who come from a long line of believers in the Methodist tradition in this community who still hold fast to the belief in Christian family and community and the good news that we have to share through hospitality that all are welcomed, all will be fed, and all can enjoy a glimmer and what the kingdom of God on earth is like. So with gratitude, with hope, with confidence, and that blessed assurance, we pray this and much more in your holy name. Amen. I invite you to offer your gifts and yourself to the ministry of Jesus Christ. <laughs>
Please pray with me. God of all people, Lord of all things, hear us as we offer this prayer of thanksgiving. We offer to you our lives and a portion of our livelihood. What we have is a blessing from you, and we humbly offer all for your holy purposes. May what we place before you on your altar bring forth comfort, mercy, peace, and justice to all who long for your love. Our closing hymn is The Spirit of God is found in the faith we sing, the soft-covered hymnal. And you can see it's on 2117. Let us sing together. Let's go on to verse 3. Last verse. go into the world having heard another portion of Mark's gospel, his way of preaching and teaching the good news of God by challenging his congregation to go out and to be part of this very story that he tells because he heard it. And so we have heard it over and over again. And over and over again, God gives us opportunities to go out into the world to be the word, to be the living word, to make God's love known. So please, when you see that opportunity, that possibility come your way, take it up. Go forth in peace. Be Christ in the world. Amen.
Thank you so much for being with us for all these Sundays. Uh, you've been such a gift to us. I know you're an amazing gift to your church family, but you know what, Heisha, we've adopted you. <laughs> you are part of our family. Uh, you're here for worship with us for all these Sundays while Elin has been away to be with family. You are part of our family now. You were with us yesterday as we represented the church uh, and the love of the church uh, for the families that came to, to grieve their lost loved ones. And you were there. And so thank you so much for really extending your grace and your talent and your professionalism uh, to us. It has truly been a gift. So we look forward to the next opportunity when Elin needs a break and we can call your name and we know you'll be with us if you can. So thank you so much again. Please thank God again for the show.